<laughs> Welcome to our last yes, colloquium of the cookie. semester. Today we have our wonderful graduate student showcase. We have three students that are going to tell us about the research they've been doing. And to start it off is David. All right. We have a transitional stats halfway. Yeah, right. I know. Oh, I like it. We yeah. have our interface slide out right here. Yeah, that was Nora's. That was intentional. Yeah. Right? Uh, yeah. so Nora, what, 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 In the selection <laughs> and in the what, what, Oh, oh, I love that dog. He can be in here. <laughs> I thought the dog was over the top. That dog is almost a graduate student. Then he has better grades than me. I think, right? I think the dog is also. What's your dog's name? Caius. 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 No, we have Cayus now. Yeah, Cayus. Canvas. <laughs> no, there's a Cayus. Cayus. Oh, it's not the Cayus. It's from like the Cayus. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's the Cayus. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, back. Okay. Right. So without further ado. <laughs> so, Luis and I, well, Luis brought me onto this project almost a year ago. Uh, but what I'm going to show you today is about two or three weeks old. We kind of transitioned to a new method. Maybe for this is kind of a test run. So any questions that you guys have will probably be very helpful for me uh, in determining whether or not it's worthwhile. Um, also, I'm going to give the talk in a slightly strange order in that I'm not going to motivate it until the end. <laughs> <laughs> That's because I might run out of time, and if I do, I'd rather you lose the motivation than you lose that. So as the title suggests, it's a linear system that I'm working with. Uh, it's made inconsistent by virtue of this epsilon. And if you're a stats student, you probably think of it uh, more as a regression problem. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, essentially, in a lot of ways, they're from formulations, in that uh, we are going to solve it via uh, least squares. And I tend to think of it as a regression problem. Least Things that I did with your system. I'm not sure yet that it matters. Um, we, as I said, solve it in the least square sense, and that's been done since before anybody here was born. Uh, there's nothing new about that. What's new is that, or kind of new, is that we're looking at systems that are very, very large. Uh, in particular, systems that are so big that you can't fit them into memory. Uh, and as I say, n is much, much greater than d, so n I'm going to call the number of observations. Uh, and there's so many observations, there, there are more observations than you have, right? which is very tall and relatively skinny. Uh, alternatively, you can think of it as streaming data. So if you've got a system that's, let's say, uh, a million observations, and you get a new 10,000 every minute or so. Ideally, you don't want to solve, resolve that entire big system over every single time. You would rather solve the system, the big system once, and then augment and update your solution. Oh, I should say also, um, as Kryn actually preceded me, uh, whichever way you think about it, it doesn't really matter. Just kind of try to tie it to what makes sense to you. Uh, whatever you've seen. The more connections you can make with what your knowledge is, the better all of these talks are going to be. The more you can them. So I'm going to go with a method uh, by Yi Chin Chen and his collaborators at the University of Washington. It was released in 2007 originally, although I have trouble believing that it's original. Uh, but all the literature that we've seen points back to this method of Chen. What he does is he partitions the data uh, so that at any given time you only have to hold uh, this, which is a d by d matrix in memory, and a d by one vector here also in memory. 
So the idea is you take the first partition, you uh, compute the div ID and the DIY1, that's all you have to hold memory, but then your second partition, you just add it in. You add it in. And then you do that as you cycle until you hit all of the data. And once you hit all the data, it's actually going to cover the exact solution that you get from your memory. Um, in some cases, uh, in fact, in what I do uh, outside of school, I don't necessarily care about an exact solution. I only need approximation. That is, I only need uh, within 10 to the negative 2 error. And so what Luis and I are really looking at is what happens if we don't care about an exact solution. We only want approximation of the solution. So if we drop A and don't visit all the data, how well can we, how close can we get to uh, the true solution? Or what are the properties, I guess, of visiting less of the data? Before we can do that, uh, maybe the partial motivation. Imagine you're given a data set, uh, like I said, very tall, but for which all of the information is contained in very few entries. So, uh, in statistics, you might think of it as a few of those entries, a few of the observations are going to be very high leverage score, and the rest of them are going to be uh, reasonably uninformative. In that scenario, if you only visit you with the data points, or if you visit, visit some subset of data points, even if it's most of them, if it doesn't include those very few high leverage uh, points, you're not really going to recover much of a solution. Uh, whatever you get is going to be the most garbage. So what we're going to do first is pre-process the matrix and try to spread that information out over the entire matrix. That way we can, once we visited some subset of the data, we know that we recovered uh, as much of the information as we can. Ideally, we would, we would have it uniformly distributed. That way, if we visit four fifths of the data points, we know we've seen four fifths of the information. It's going to turn out that we can't do it that way reliably. Um, I'm going to get to that in a second. First, though, I want to make sure uh, that this pre processing matrix uh, P, uh, which is like here near Eilon and Bernard Chazelle, they used it first for the uh, Ash Johnson and Stress Transform. <laughs> Similar context, but slightly different. Um, I want to make sure that by applying this P matrix, I'm not going to actually change the solution. So all you need for that is to have one model transform, which this HD that I'm going to explain later is. Um, if you've got an orthonormal transform, then if I apply it to the A matrix, you get A tilde. Apply it to the B matrix, you get or B vector, you get B tilde. Then this solution, the least squared solution, is going to be the exact same. So P consists of two matrices. Uh, first of all, H, H is the randomized, or is not randomized, is the deterministic Hadamard transformer. Uh, it's got a few properties that we need. First of all, it's orthogonal. Really, it's actually orthonormal. Um, so it's not going to change the rank of our matrix. It's not going to change the solution. Second of all, the entries are all magnitude and the negative one half. That's going to be important to have here. And third of all, and Almost most importantly for our purposes, uh, you don't have to store the entire matrix to be able to apply it. So, if I, as long as I can apply it to a single vector, uh, let me back that up. If I have a single vector of size n, as long as I can store that single vector of size n, I can apply the Hadamard transform without actually constructing it. Uh, it's just kind of a trick of how the Hadamard transform is constructed. And I can do it in order n log n times, so it's very fast. It scales up easily mm -hmm. with the amount of data that you've got. D is going to be a random matrix uh, diagonal with u form probability one or one or negative one uh, along that diagonal. Because of that D, <coughs> I apply it, let's say, to a unit vector, and this will scale up to matrices. Um, if I apply it to a unit vector, uh, the expectation of that vector is going to be zero. And the variance due to this n to the negative one half here is going to be n to the negative one, and that means that I can, well, Trump, Joel Trout pointed out um, that we can use Huffington's inequality to say that any particular entry in the matrix uh, or in the vector is going to be bounded. Um, what this means is that 
the information that was originally contained in some potentially small uh, subset of the vector is now spread out across the entire vector exactly as we want it. And it's spread out probabilistically. Uh, so I can't say that the maximum leverage of any single point is this, but I can say it's probably not more than some. So once it's been pre-processed, I can put it back into the structure of the chain. The notice here, there's a lambda randomization term. The reason for that is if our matrix, even if it is uh, full column rank, any subset of it might not be. So if I stop early, I might not. If I stop early, it might uh, not be invertible. And so I add that lambda in trailer as allow it to be invertible. Also, it's going to uh, control the complexity of our solution. And then but you want the lambda outside of sum, right? Correct. Well, it doesn't really matter. I could just scale it down. Yeah, well, <laughs> um, <laughs> we are changing that time. Sure. Um, it's going to also control the complexity, like I said. If we do go on to work on English problems, which is the goal of this work, uh, then that land is going to be important. Or it's the goal of the next set of work. Actually. Yeah, so for English problems, you just change the identity for the regular. Exactly. So then the question comes back, of course, to how do I choose K? How do I know how much of the data I should visit? That's going to be partial, that's going to be really informed by this updating uh, inequality from the slide before. And it's been addressed by uh, Peter's Grenades and his collaborator with Berkeley. Um, they show that they have a bound for how close you can be in probability to the true least square solution. Um, if you take a certain number of samples. The problem is if you want to get really close to, or if you want to say get 10 to the negative 2 <coughs> precision to the true least square solution, uh, that that number might, the number of samples that you might have to take still might not be And that's why we put it back in our check. Uh, so it, in some sense, you could think of what we're doing as a combination of uh, the work of Drenaeus, which tells you how many samples you need, and the work of Chen which tells you how to do it. In addition to that, of course, we've got this regularization term that we have. Uh, third, very important point, uh, is that this is easily parallelizable. So you can speed it up drastically by, for instance, shipping off each of these multiple matrix multiplications to a different core and recombining them together. You could also, uh, for instance, solve this entire X tilde on one core, Randomize what you're subselecting, <coughs> solve it on another core, solve, and do that, recombine those at the end to try to get a better approximation of XI. I've got an intuition perhaps for what that how that might result, um, but I haven't done any of the analysis on it. That's kind of taking a back seat to trying to figure out uh, this first problem. Now I've got a bit three minutes for the motivation here. Uh, my motivation is actually different from Luis's, <laughs> as we found out when I tried to do it. I think of everything, like I said, in terms of regression, so I think of it in terms of a prediction problem. And in a prediction problem, you're interested in knowing, okay, given the sample I've trained this model, how well is it going to do on some of our heads? And that question is, in some sense, it would be answered had the information uh, by this empirical risk. This loss is the L2 loss. And if we had this joint uh, this joint distribution here, then we would know exactly how well we're going to do on any given sample. Unfortunately, we don't. We've only got access to a finite sample. Um, in the limit, this is the same thing uh, as you take n to infinity, but we only have some small subset. And in statistical learning theory, a very um, salient question, I guess, is how well does this, it's called the empirical risk, approximate this expected risk? It's answered by a reasonably ugly uh, formula given by Lavnik 
uh, like most things in statistical engineering. And it's not terribly important to understand all of it. What is important is this gives a worst case for generalized code. So what's the maximum difference between the empirical risk and the expected risk? And the bound is actually not very tight, and you in practice don't really use it, but it does serve to confirm our intuition. The intuition is, as we get more samples, uh, since these got the ends are in the denominator here, as we get more samples, we're better able to generalize. And so by applying method trend and allowing us to visit all the samples that we have access to, we might be able to generalize a little bit better. Uh, and the other important part is this D sub H, which is reasonably complicated, but really it's just the complexity of your solution. And so, for instance, if you've got, let's say, 100 data points, and you try to fit it with an 80 degree polynomial, that's a very complex solution for some few data points. That's not gonna, you might get very good empirical risk, but that's not gonna generalize very well. So that notion is borne out by this, uh, this here equation. So the idea is uh, by introducing the lambda where we control the complexity of our solution, which is going to increase the generalizability. And by using something similar to this method of Chen, we're able to visit as many or arbitrarily many points, provided we can do it. Uh, support of these points and interests. Thank you. So, where did the noise go? At the Where'd beginning, you talked something about the noise, and then you began to talk again. So, mm. so, the information about the noise, can you tell me, does it help you somehow? It may. Um, so, the noise is the whole reason that we. Use the options. Yeah. Um, after that, honestly, I forgot about it. <laughs> sometimes you know something about how we can work. Right. If you know something about the noise, surely you could tell you something about the lambda. Yeah, so the noise is, you haven't talked about how you judge how good your estimate is. So that's where the noise is going to come in. And the lambda is kind of a signal to noise sometimes. So <laughs> So it comes in there, and the, F, the noise is what makes B not in the color space of A. So, of course. And so the noise is exactly why we have to this. But so you haven't talked about after. assessing the actual statistical properties of the solution. That would have been the Sure. Once we actually get to formulating the solution, I think that's what I'm starting to do. So we, for example, can look at the residuals and see how they move, see when we start. Estimate and all the way first slide of pre processing? That. Yeah. That. Yeah. That. Yeah. When you display in the middle there, when you say that a randomized system. Is that what I'm talking about? Randomized yeah. system. So the one on the right has the same solution. Correct. As because this is orthogonal, what do you think you can say? This looks like A P trans A transpose P transpose. Yeah. Yeah. And the P's cancel out. P's cancel out in here. Yeah. I think maybe I would yeah, it makes sense or not. Maybe we can do something different before so thank you so much. Other questions? When you did the regularization and introduced the regularization, there are tons of regularization methods out there. There are. This, why this, why not something else? When I saw this and saw this that you're thinking about truncating and so on, doing things iteratively, I just wanted to throw out sort of a, a reference and maybe so there's a there's a paper on Inverse problems, SIAM review paper by Arnold Neumeyer from Iowa. Uh, he, he talked about a method in there called iterated lamp paper. Lamp paper regulation. Iterated lamp paper. And that seems to lend itself nicely to truncating methods. 
literally talking about the size of analysis here, although it's not this kind of block truncation. So that's the truncation of the SVD. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not the SVD, but it's related to kind of, it's, it's sort of a smooth SVD. It's actually an interesting kind of Yeah, 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 I think I've seen it. It's a guy from Austria? Yeah. 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 And it, it's actually, he just built this into his review paper. It's actually something that an American Riley did in the late 50s. And it's published in some weird journal. I think uh, Jim Nagy has worked on this question as well. Because so maybe that might be worth looking at them considering here. Sure, so regularized via early stocking rather than regularized via this kind of parameter. There's both. Sure. Yeah, that. Thank you. Uh, okay. uh, I'm wondering what your intuition was regarding. Uh, I don't know how you would treat these X tildes uh, if you sample different subsets of the uh, partition. Um, I don't know how you would treat them to get X hat. I imagine it would be a mean or something. But what's your intuition regarding the convergence with the sample of the Sure. I would imagine, again, there's no nothing really to back this up. But if I do it by infinity mean, then I'm going to cut the variance by the square root of n, kind of like this. For every time I saw this. And do you think you have the analytic tools? Like, do you think this is all well developed enough that you could attack this problem? Oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, maybe eventually. Well, certainly eventually, but not yet. Yeah. It's just all I can do to get enough theories stitched together to think I can go as high as possible. Thank you. Keep talking. Maybe. So plug in and plug it back in because that's always a good solution. Okay. Oh, yeah, I do. I'll yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Oh, no, I don't. I have it on my other computer, but I'll come on this one. I mean, we can see it. You can see it, so we're just going to roll with it and not waste a lot of time. All right, so um, we're going to sh slowly shift towards math. Um, you're going to kind of get a with some methods for parameter estimation of a stochastic SCIR model using Bayesian inference, and yes, that is a mouthful. So I'm going to start by motivating it. Um, <laughs> so we can, in um, the applied math sector, we can use differential equations to describe um, large-scale population epidemics like Ebola, Zika, or mumps, or basically any sort of population level epidemic that we have. Um, we, there's lots of different frameworks for it. Um, a very simple one is the one we're going to talk about today, which is the SEIR model, um, where you have susceptibles that become exposed, so they're not infectious yet, and then they become infectious after some period of wait time, and then they become recovered or removed, which is the polite way to say dead. Um, so, um, a real goal for this project is to extend, extend this existing deterministic framework um, that there's a ton of literature on this deterministically, a ton, in lots of different ways, um, to incorporate stochastic dynamics into the model. That's goal number one. Um, why this is really important is because for smaller epidemics um, that um, we're kind of baffled by, um, inconsistency in infection and recovery rates between countries, between locations, whatever, what have you, um, can really um, be crucial in determining the evolution of epidemics. And so stochastic elements are really important. So being infectious for three days versus four days makes an impact on a small epidemic. We no longer have the central limit theorem. It also may explain large versus small outbreaks when you have the similar conditions across the region um, because um, you have people, again, being kind of random in how they're acting. Another big important thing is we want to 
estimated parameters. And um, the way we're going to do it, um, mostly because I started working with Aaron Porter, um, is using Bayesian inference. And this has a lot of um, advantages over other methods for parameter estimation. One big thing is you get more information about the estimates. You're not getting a point estimator and some error bound or something like that, or uh, what's, I'm a bit of Bayesian for about a year, so I'm forgetting the word. <laughs> um, but you get a distribution, so you get all the moments or whatever, what have you. So you get more information, and then also you can um, incorporate prior knowledge of the epidemics. So for example, with Ebola, um, one example is this latent period. Um, this is one over the latent period, alpha. And for Ebola, typically it's between four and 10 days. You are, uh, no, infection, sorry, I'm gonna talk infection. You're typically infectious for four to 10 days. Um, but it can range from two to 21 biologically. And so you could put some distribution where there's more likelihood on that four to 10 range and less on that two to 21 and none beyond that because that's what we know through research of this disease. And so you can incorporate that. Another thing that was on the slide I got rid of is, um, um, well, I'll talk about that after in a minute. So never mind. <laughs> Our big, big, big long-term, hopefully I finish this by the time I finish my PhD kind of goal, um, is to do this spatially. Um, we really want to build a stochastic spatial model. That can put an eye there. Um, <laughs> that is an eye. Um, we want to build a stochastic spatial model. That's our big, huge goal. Um, what's really cool is I found some spatial Ebola data, so that hopefully I can use. Um, but to understand our algorithms and understand our processes, we really need to simplify it down so we understand what we're doing first. So I'm gonna kinda of go through that, we'll talk a little bit about what we're doing spatially, and then we'll go from there. So, we're gonna use approximate Bayesian computation. Um, there are other types of Bayesian inferences, particularly a lot of you know, NCMC is one. Um, we're not gonna use NCMC um, because the likelihood is really hard to write down explicitly when you get really complicated models. In the ODE case, you can write it down, I've done it. I, can, I have code that runs NCMCs on it, but since our goal is spatial, we're gonna kinda of go in this other direction. Um, it also, when you have a lot of parameters, it produces parameter autocorrelation, which becomes really challenging for tuning. So we're going with an, uh, ABC. So ABC is this idea of approximating these distributions um, by doing the, these five steps. You're gonna propose a set of theta stars, which are your parameters, from some prior. So again, that prior information that we have about the parameters. We're gonna run a forward model Again, a forward model, we're not sure what that is yet, um, to get a sample data set, a generated data set that, the, um, that we can compare then to the true data. So we're just gonna basically stick them on top of each other in some way, shape, or form with some metric. Again, that's kind of up in the air. And then if they're close enough, we're gonna accept that set of parameter values. And then we'll do that a bunch of times, basically. Um, so the two main things that change from method to method to model to model is the forward model and then what metrics you use. And those are the two key points here. So I'm gonna talk about the forward model, talk a little bit about metrics, and then we'll go to spatial stuff. So here's our discretized ODE. Um, we're going to, I mean, you do time plus H, depends on the previous times, and S, E, I, and R are what we just talked about, susceptible, exposed, infectious, and removed at time T. So those stay the same, where the so plasticity comes in are these B, C, and D terms, which are the transition populations. And they're generated by binomials. Um, so you have a binomial that's drawn from your potential susceptible people, right? And you have some probability of being, becoming exposed, basically. And what's really cool is those depend on that ODE that we have. So that's our infection rate. We have, depending on how many contacts you have with an infectious individual. And those can be generated direct, directly from um, conditional probabilities from the ODE. And so there's a very clear way to do that. I'm not gonna show it, but it can be done. Deb did a lot of work on this with her branching Ebola model, if you're very interested in that. Um, so next, we're gonna talk about metrics. Um, and so what metrics do you use? There's a ton of different metrics you can choose from. Um, we've tried L2 norms, we've tried cumulative sums, we've tried point-wise norms. There's tons of things that you can do. Um, in the ODE case, a lot of them work. Um, but again, we're thinking towards spatial and we're thinking towards large problem. And so what we're going to do, um, another thing we have to think about, sorry, I forgot about this, 
is what data can you get? Because it'd be really nice to just compare all four populations at every time and just be like, is that close? Yes, great. But you're not gonna get the number of susceptible people at time t, nor are you gonna get the exposed because they don't have symptoms. <laughs> They're rocking around like susceptible people waiting to become dangerous. <laughs> um, so the feasible data you can get is number of infectious, um, number of new cases, which is actually what we have for Ebola, um, number of de uh, deaths on each day, um, a final time, a final size of the epidemic, those are the kind of things. So that back half of that schematic is what you could feasibly get. You're not gonna get all of these and they're not all gonna be perfect. Um, you also can get cumulative some ones, but typically you can transform them. So what we're going to do is we're going to use um, a relative difference between the peak week and the peak total. Um, so what that is, is the peak week are these two lines. So we're gonna take the relative, di oh, peak week is these two lines. Um, so that's when the peak occurs. So when that maximum thing is happening, basically. Um, and so we'll take the difference of the two and divide by the magnitude of the true. And if that, and then the difference between these two, the relative difference, if the, both of those are left less than some epsilon we choose, we're going to accept that. And then you kind of narrow your epsilon windows and you're happy about that. Oh, sorry. Red is uh, our true data set. Um, it, I'll explain why I put quotes around that, and then black is just an example. Um, so this is just comparing two different epidemics. Um, these are I of T. You can, depending on what data you have, you would compare different things. Um, so again, we're in this verification process because once we apply this to data, we really want to understand what we're getting out of this. Um, and we, if we just start throwing things at data and we get stuff back, we won't really understand what we're getting. So we're gonna generate a test data set that we're gonna treat as true from these parameters, um, and then we're gonna run the algorithm on it, um, treating it as true. So we're pretending we know what this looks like. And we're gonna run it with really uninformative priors, so I'm pretending I know nothing about alpha and beta, and then structurally, uh, gamma is not identifiable because beta and gamma, if you raise one and lower the other, they kind of make up for each other. So you're really looking for the proportion of those two. It's just a structural identifiability, not a practical unidentifiability. So we can run this. We get, if we look at red, is our true epidemic. And then we get a cloud of accepted epidemics around it. Um, that's kind of what a run looks like. We accept a bunch of different epidemics. And those pass the visual test, right? They kind of have the same shape. I'm pretty sure my epsilon window was not super um, harsh on this, as you can see, because our peak total is like 450 or 425-ish, and you only go up to about 650-ish, so you're, that's a pretty generous range. So you can get parameters back, um, and this, these are the distributions we're talking about. Um, if you notice, we proposed parameters over this entire range for beta, um, and it only accepted a distribution that's looking very, very nice and narrow. Um, and it's really, really, the, the mean and the mode of that distribution is really, really close, close to the true value. Um, the fact that it's not right on um, is not that concerning. Um, if it was way off, we'd be concerned, but because it's close enough, um, we just need convergence um, that's near the true value. Um, and so we have that. We don't have as great a convergence for alpha, um, but we can, by, I mean, it's pretty good because it peaks up and we're pretty happy about it. Alpha is a weird parameter because it doesn't affect the spread as much as just how long it takes and how, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a weird parameter because that's that latent period. Um, but you can do things to heighten it up more and do things like that by fixing beta or drawing for the distribution. There's things you can do. So we're really happy with that and we're going to move on. Namely, we're going to move on to a spatial model. So I cut out a bunch of slides that remind you of what the PD looks like because I wanted to get to these slides. Um, so we're gonna start with a really, really simple model where we have um, three spatial locations. You can move left or right, and then you can't move off the boundary, and then you can stay. Um, and we'll have, um, we will have probabilities of doing each of those things, and if you look at that, at least in this case, that's a three choice process, and we're gonna call it a multinomial. Um, it's kind of like a random walk, and the way we're going to find that is by drawing a multinomial draw with some probability vector, um, which are these probabilities, 
um, that kind of corresponds to leaving node i to node j, and then there's things like that. Um, one big thing that I'm going to point out that is a simplifying assumption at this point that we hope we can get rid of in the future um, is this. The population you're drawing from is susceptible minus the newly exposed people. So we're going to assume at, at each time you can either move compartmentally, so you can move like your status, so whether you're susceptible or exposed or infectious or removed, or you can move spatially and not both. <laughs> so you can't be like traveling and, and interact with somebody and get sick and then go to a new spot at the same time point. Huge simplifying assumption, but it made it a lot easier in our life. So we can do that. Um, if you notice, what we get out of that is a vector of susceptibles or exposed um, moving from node example two to one, staying or going from two to three. That's kind of what you get. Um, we're happy about that, that makes a lot of sense, but that is um, not exactly what we're gonna want because that's the number of people leaving a spatial location or potentially staying. We want the net number of people coming in. <laughs> that's what we're really worried about because we wanna know at the next time point how many people are still there, right? And so instead of, we look at this and that's, that is a row of a matrix. Instead, just flip it and look at sum, the sum of the column and that's gonna be the number of people the net number of people um, at the next time point that stay at that spatial location or that are at that spatial location for you to draw at the next time point. Um, so that's how you kind of go from this multinomial draw to some net number of people that stay. So if we assume, this is another assumption we're making, that only E and S move because they're very similar um, demographically. Um, for example, why you're not having an eye move is if you have Ebola, you're hemorrhaging, and you may not be moving a whole heck of a lot. <laughs> you're probably pretty static. Um, we could add slight movement to that population, and then R moving doesn't matter. And so you can write down a very simple model for that, a 3 no model in this case, that we can run. And so this is an example of a run. This is the S population. This has a, um, the movement probabilities are really uneven, and so there's this bias towards moving to the right, <laughs> you're right. Um, but you see that S goes down, R goes up, and E and I wiggle, <laughs> which is good. <laughs> that's qualitative behavior that we like. <laughs> so that's great. Um, now we can do parameter estimations on this. Yes? So you three part model? Yeah, I just drew a line because it looks really ugly if you don't. Um, so you have one, two, three, and so just ignore the lines in between. Yeah, eventually, the whole idea of this is we're not thinking like a, um, what's the word for it? A patch model. We're not thinking patch models. We're actually thinking of a domain that we're going to discretize. And so think of this more as a smoothing of our domain in between. So that's, that's why I draw lines, because that's the way Steve and I think. Um, <laughs> mainly Steve. Uh, <laughs> but so we can do parameter estimations on this. And they look awesome, at least for alpha and beta. I haven't gotten to the movement probability, so don't hold your horses. But you can do this for tightening S epsilon windows, and you see that this last one is the prettiest, because you've tightened the epsilon window. And this is using the same metric, that peak week, peak total metric. So that's really promising. So we're going to kind of move on from that. We know we can get parameters back from that. We can get distributions. We're happy. And then we look at this. <laughs> These are the movement probabilities. So this is moving from one to two, two to one, two to three, three to two. It doesn't really matter if you remember that. Just notice that the true values don't really localize near, some of them do, but they, they peak up, so that's at least promising. They're not uniform, but they don't look great. Um, so what we, what we discovered, sorry, I've been a little sick. Um, what we've discovered is actually the difference between the two, so this is the interface between two and three, and this is the interface between one and two. The difference, so that probability of flux between the two spatial locations is actually more informative of the actual movement probabilities than the individual probabilities themselves, which makes kind of some intu intuitive sense. Um, and when you generate epidemics using this versus these distributions, you actually get really good um, uniform uh, closeness to a true epidemic. Um, again, these were 
these ABC runs were on fake data that I generated. We'll just, I forgot to mention that. Um, and so we're gonna kind of roll with that. Um, what's really nice is this is very easily scalable. Um, there's only a little bit of code you have to do, a little bit of thinking about 3D matrices rather than 2D matrices, but I've done it, and you can get a 2D model. Um, so this is um, a 2D model, 10 compartments. This is I at time t, a heat map of I. And so black is a lot of infectious people that are spreading over to a domain. Um, this was just some movement probabilities, and you see they start to die up in the middle because you've given up on your epidemic, and then they're just gonna kind of die off and spread. That's really awesome and exciting, and we like that. <laughs> okay, so this is kind of where the stuff stands. We know a little bit about our movement probabilities, we know we can get parameters back, and we have this potential for spatial stuff. So what we want to do is to continue to really understand those movement probabilities, because um, as you scale up, you can imagine you get a lot more of them, <laughs> which is problematic. Um, so we want to continue to understand that. Um, we also want to adjust computational methods to tackle really large problems, because um, that 10 by 10 one, I didn't do any parameter estimation on that. I just generated that epidemic, and it took a little bit. <laughs> so we want to start looking at parallelization. Some, uh, luckily, ABC is very parallelizable, which is good. So we want to look at that, and then we want to start applying the, uh, an appropriate model to epidemic data. And like I mentioned, we have spatial, spatially homogeneous and spatially heterogeneous Ebola data. SCI are not, might not fit for that. We have spatially heterogeneous cholera data. We have, we have a bunch of different data sets that we might be looking at. Um, we are just starting to do that, and so I didn't show you any of that, but we're running into some issues, of course, as you would. Um, so we're looking at uh, uh, infection rate that varies and some other realities of that. But that's where we are right now. Some acknowledgments, um, especially Dr. Pankovic, and some references. And I will take some quick questions because I went a little over. <laughs> I'll take questions while he's setting up. Or no questions. I'll go for it. Uh, alpha and beta? Um, to alpha not as sensitive, as you probably saw, but beta very sensitive. Um, so you get some pretty, it clearly does not like betas that are out of the range. It can't. The ODE as well, yes. Yeah. If you think about it, the, o, the statistical method, at least for the ODE, since we're, we're making up what spatial confusion looks like, for the ODE, it's just a discretized version of that. And so really, there, once you do that, you average those, you get the ODE back. Yeah, so you, I mean, there's a little bit more variable, but it's very sensitive to beta. When did the GE go? Yeah. Exactly. When you showed that, those, those, those three circles? Yeah, that was the When you said it's a movie with little squares in there. Yeah. Are, they, are, they, are all those squares part of the scheme by the of GE? Yes. Yes. And they're talking to each other as if they're compartments. Is that okay? Yep, that's exactly it. Yeah. No. Yours looks better than mine. <laughs> so, so is, that, is, is it sensible to have the, the discrete mobility of the GE on the same kind of scale alongside the uh, compartments? Um, ideally, we would like that. <laughs> uh, we would like to start get. I mean, ideally, we would like to be very discrete so that we can start smoothing this. Um, Computationally, that might not be a reality. Um, and the data we have will be, the data I have right now is, um, for Ebola at least, and for cholera, is like provinces of Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea. And so it's like, I mean, they're smaller than states, but think of it in that way. And so we can't go much narrower than that unless we start chopping those up and then aggregating them to compare to the data, which we can do. But that, again, computationally is a nightmare. <laughs> All right, let's thank me again. Yeah. All right, Peter, do you want next? Uh, I'll be good. Jane, you also. who will tell us about the presentation. Uh, hi, everyone. I guess I'm completing the chapter of uh, the survey of math in our department, so now we know about every type of math. Ever. <laughs> this one in practical. Okay, so to start things off, I need to kind of maybe define some things. So let's start off with this term, hemostasis. So hemostasis is just a very technical term to describe 
when you have an injury in your body, it's the process to stop moving. So uh, to motivate it, let's look at a little cartoon. So here I have a rectangle representing a segment of a blood vessel. We have blood flow coming from the left to the right. Um, and I've highlighted um, that you have these like these cells in your in your blood called platelets that uh, tend to uh, move along the walls of this blood vessel. So let's say we have an injury, and let's say this injury is severe enough where we start losing blood outside the vessel. So we call this an extravascular injury. So of course we're losing blood, so how does our body respond? Well, there are these proteins, uh, in particular one called collagen, and another called tissue factor that are exposed when this injury happens. And two important processes are initiated from these proteins. Uh, the first one is from deals with these platelets. So now uh, when these platelets reach this injury zone and uh, are contact with collagen, um, they can become activated and begin adhering to the wall, which I've highlighted with these green ovals. And uh, at the same time, um, there is a cascade of these biochemical reactions known as a coagulation cascade that's initiated by tissue factor. So these things are actually occurring simultaneously, and um, you have all these reactions occurring not only um, with tissue factor, but also on the surfaces of these activated platelets. So you have this cascade of aggregation and coagulation, and eventually you get to a final protein that gets cleaved called fibrin. So first you have this plug of platelets, and the fibrin creates this kind of mesh gel to stabilize the clot, and you stop bleeding. Okay, so this, this is what happens when your system is, no, is functioning normally. So uh, what we're interested in is variations where, that can cause bleeding, and the, the most popularly known form of, ble of bleeding disorder is known as hemophilia, which is actually associated with a deficiency in a particular protein. Or there's actually a few different proteins. Um, and you can, you can show that there are certain people who have hemophilia that will not be able to produce these blood clots stably and tend to bleed. But what is interesting is that it's that this deficiency alone doesn't tell us whether or not they will bleed. Um, you can have two individuals who have a deficiency in this protein be diagnosed with hemophilia, or one of them can bleed and one of them don't bleed. And the question is, uh, why why, does this, why is there this difference? Like what's the variation that's causing this difference? So um, our goal as a research group um, is to create this interdisciplinary approach, a cis bio approach, systems biology approach, to develop both computational and experimental models to um, look, at, uh, look at bleeding. And once we develop these models to look at uh, bleeding, we can uh, boil down the possible parameters that may cause um, so, so today's talk is kind of a journey of how we're iteratively building these models together. By both, I mean an experimental model, which is done in the chemical engineering department here at MIND, in the NEEDS lab, and our computational model. So, all, so right now, if you want to look at these goals that I've highlighted out, we're kind of at one still. <laughs> um, okay, so to start things off, let's talk about the experimental setup. So here. Um, on starting from the left, we have these two pumps uh, with a specified pressure PW and a pressure PV. W stands for wash, V stands for blood. Uh, you have these very long tubes that um, push this wash on one side of the channel and blood pushes on the other side of the channel. And if we zoom into this device here, um, it looks like a sideways H. Um, so these pressures are picked in such a way where um, on the top, which is the blood channel right now, um, is allowed to flow from the top through this intersection, which we're specifying as the injury region, and then is able to flow out. And of course, uh, because of the design, uh, we, uh, our experimentalists can uh, basically model model a injury with a um, initiated by the same proteins, tissue factor and collagen. And we have now a setup to measure not only um, when this would occlude, as well as things like the flow rate out of this injury channel once it closes up, and when that occurs. Okay, uh, so as a uh, course, I, I said this is what the point of the experiment. We had a paper published yes, uh, last year. Why did I say yesterday? <laughs> um, <laughs> not yesterday. Um, yes. So here is, um, wow, you cannot see it on this projector. Okay. 
Well, here is a uh, some snapshots of some um, experimental images uh, from our collaborators of this bleeding chip. Uh, now this is actually an H, so on the right, it's really hard to see here. This is the blood channel, this is the wax channel, and then from right to left, we're flowing where this is the injury. And from the images, over time, you see that the channel will plug up after about 10 minutes. So um, us as a, a computational people, we want to build models to do a similar thing. So what's the first thing we did? Uh, we wanted to find a way to approximate the fluid dynamics in the channel. So here, uh, to do this, we're going to assume that the fluid behaves like an incompressible fluid, a uh, Newtonian fluid. So I don't know if anyone does fluids in here, but um, those who do um, are very familiar with these equations. So here, uh, the first equation is the non-dimensional form of the um, momentum equation for your stokes So you can think of this as Newton's second law. So you have the forces are balanced by mass times acceleration. And uh, to close this system, you need a, a mass conservation statement, which is uh, given by this uh, equation. Uh, divergence of the velocity field has to be zero. Um, and those are curious. The non-dimensional number that uh, comes out of this equation will be non-dimensionalized. It's known as the Reynolds number. And in our simulations, uh, it's typically pretty small. Okay, so the thing that was challenging initially doing this was um, they're specifying pressures to do the fluid simulations, and you're actually solving for the velocity here. So one challenge is how, how you incorporate these boundary conditions using pressure data. So the way we do this is, of course, um, we use something called a pseudo-traction boundary condition. So this is like a Neumann condition for the momentum equation. And uh, this, is, this was found in this paper by Haywood. And basically what you do instead is you apply a mean pressure on the inlets and the outlets of your domain. And of course, uh, for the rest of the walls, we're going to assume that the velocity uh, satisfies a no-slope condition, which means that the velocity is zero on the field. All right, so uh, something you may have noticed in the schematic of the bleeding chip is the fact that um, there's all this tubing that's really far away, and then actually in the snapshot of all the images of the bleeding chip, the, the vertical channels are actually on the order of like thousands of microns long. And then all the interesting dynamics that occur in uh, the, the pictures are on the order of hundreds of microns. So we don't want to model all this tube or all this channel of just, it's just, there's nothing interesting happening. And, not, and the other issue is that if we want to do that, um, we need to know, okay, well, what are the pressures of where I'm going to model the fluid flow at? So we have, we know the information here, 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 and here, but we don't know where we want uh, the pressure that are inside the computation over there. So the way we do this is we construct a linear circuit model that is analogous to how the domain is set up. Okay, so, and if you've ever done anything with circuits, um, there's always, there's a hydrodynamic analog for Ohm's law and for mass conservation. So, for example, for Ohm's law, we can write down that the change in pressure is equal to the flow rate times some resistance, where this resistance depends on the dimensions of your channel. And uh, to close the system, we need a mass conservation statement, so we can simply use the fact that the flow in so these flow rates in have to be balanced by the flow rates out. And you can write down a linear system and you can get approximations for these mean pressures. So that's how we set up the fluid, the fluid model. And in the same paper from I pointed out earlier, uh, here is a snapshot in 3D of the velocity field for the fluid, uh, snapshot of the wall shear rates on the same domain. And for a first step qualitative validation, we put tracer, passive tracer particles in the velocity field and compared it to an experimental uh, result, just looking at blood flowing through the same channel of the same size. So we were really happy with this. Okay, so this is only just fluid dynamics, so the next goal is to add uh, some model that is a part of blood coagulation and, and hemostasis. So we thought it is a good surrogate model, we would start looking at platelet aggregation. So here uh, we have a proposed simplified model to look at platelet aggregation that has five species. So to start things off, uh, we have um, platelets that are mobile and unactivated. So just as we saw in the cartoon, uh, they can be uh, bound to, uh, to collagen and become activated. Uh, once you have collagen-bound activated platelets, 
they can release a chemical known as ADP, which I'm not going to get into. And those, and because this ADP is released, you can get activated platelets, or they're calling them sticky platelets here. Uh, and then finally, uh, another interesting component of the model is that as you get these bound platelets, other platelets can cohere to them, which we have captured through this term PDU, which is when a bound, unactivated platelet is, is cohered versus a activated or sticky platelet coheres to the bound mass. And uh, one last feature is the fact that these bound, unactivated ones don't are, they don't go on bond strongly, so they can come off. All right, so uh, as you saw also in the picture is that the platelets are actually these individual, you can say, I guess you can call them particles, uh, which we don't want to model every single platelet. So instead, we track them as a continuum and look at some number, some number density of those platelets. Um, and of course, because these platelets, as they uh, reach a region, become more packed, we need to account for their size. So the way we do this is um, we first track their total volume fraction. So all this is is the sum of every species divided by some maximum uh, number density. And then we can uh, use this function, to, uh, use this value to map it to a function that tells us, oh, as we become more bound, the transport of those platelets get limited. So here is a plot of uh, the function we're using. So the way we think of this is if you have no bound or no, no platelets in some region of the domain, you're able to move freely. And as you become fully bound, so the volume fraction hits one, uh, you can't move anymore. Does that mean you just start building? So you'll see it in the next slide. Um, it's going to be a, it's going to affect the ejection and the fusion. Okay, so I'm only going to show one of the PEs for this system because they look pretty similar. So here's the the PDE for the mobile unactivated platelets. So here we have the rate of change of the mobile platelets uh, with respect to time. Uh, we have infection. Uh, of those platelets that are hindered by that volume fraction. That's all I'm going to say here. Their, their, their diffusion is limited also due to this volume fraction. Um, those platelets can uh, adhere due to exposed collagen, which is the first initiation of this system. Uh, they can be activated by ADP. They can be bound to other bound <coughs> platelets. And finally, they can come off. So this is just all the terms that we described in the schematic. Um, unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about what these terms are. Uh, they're quite uh, involved and complicated, how we do them numerically. So I'm just, if you're curious, I'd be happy to talk to you about it later. Um, and of course, for the mobile sticky footage, we have a similar PDE, and then the rest of the species, we're assuming they don't move because they're bound. So they're just OEDs at each point on the domain. Okay. Uh, of course, we talked about this big, complicated platelet model, but how do we feed that back to the fluid dynamics? So the way we do this is we assume that the, the volume fraction of all the bound platelets, so here we're only looking at the bound ones, can, are going to limit the velocity and act as a, a porous media. So we capture that by adding a Brinkman term to our incompressible non stokes of platelets. Okay, uh, just to summarize numerical methods, if you're curious what I've been using, uh, for uh, mo all the software is built around using this package known as Phoenix, which is a uh, C++ Python uh, software library for solving PEs using the finite element method. Um, our Navier Stokes Brinkman equations are discretized using a uh, projection method uh, using Taylor Hood elements. Uh, here's a reference if you're curious about the method. And for the platelets and the ADP, which I omitted for this talk. Uh, for all the mobile ones, we use this thing known as algebraic flux correction for the evection fusion, and then just a simple, explicit room for the two for the reactions. And uh, everything is written in-house and parallelized using these packages. Okay, so these results are actually old, but um, it's okay, because we had a breakthrough in our research yesterday. <laughs> so uh, I was hoping uh, this talk was actually next week, which I thought originally, but um, <laughs> this will still give you a flavor of what the results look like. So these are all done in 2D. So just to remind you, um, on the right there's a blood channel, on the left there's a wash channel, through here is an injury channel. We assume that there's some upstream mobile unactivated platelets that um, are brought into the domain. And here we're just looking at the time evolution of, our, of the model, of the mobile platelets in our model. So, in this preliminary test, we looked at just after about 75 seconds, um, you see that we have, uh, we were losing the amount of 
mobile platelets in the injury channel due to one, they're cohering and adhering to the walls, as well as the fact that as they're cohering, the streamlines in the domain are shifting out. So eventually, if I kept plotting this out, eventually, like you almost have no flow going through here. So in this preliminary test, we can't actually include the domain in this setup. And I tried to look at the compared to experimental results, but I don't want to make any claims about whether this is similar enough or not. So uh, thankfully, um, the fix that we figured out was related to an issue with this volume correction going over one. Um, we found a fix yesterday, so we should have any results for that too. So here, um, we've done a qualitative validation of fluid dynamics for this bleeding chip using a 3D model. We uh, proposed this platelet model that we're going to use to uh, compare against experiments and hopefully have good validation of those experiments and be able to look at it in various injury sizes and for longer times. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank my collaborators and my research funding and happy to take any questions. Which one? This one? Yeah. So in the very first one, we've got fluid flow going down. Yep, so the, there's some pressure. Yeah, so the pressures are actually specified so you have fluid flow that looks like this basically extreme. Why why is it all why does all the fluid on this uh, left hand right side shoot right at? Why why is it? It seems like there's pressure pushing out. Yeah. Pushing the out, but it, it gets some blood coming out from the bottom. bottom. I guess I don't understand your question. Can you point it out to me? The bottom is very blood coming from out here. There's so much that's pushing all in. Uh, and none of this is coming down. Well, there is, there is some coming down, but it's just the way the pressure drop is, in, is set up that you basically have this. There's like a pressure drop that goes, that's more dominant going this way versus going down. There is, there is flow going down, but it's just, the magnitude is much smaller than the flow through here. And that computer changes in the next? Yeah, over time it, it, it basically like shifts down as the, the channel starts uh, cohering and the valve plates start cohering. I think maybe you're getting confused. Don't think of the colors as being fluid. Yes. Vectors. So this is... Uh, the, the colors are the concentration, the density of the platelet. But if you were to look at the vector field of the fluid, right, it would be moved down over. Yeah. That would be interesting. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That picture doesn't show up too well. Well, no. <laughs> uh, no, no, it is not. It's been yeah. shown to be. Someone very really seems to make a difference to the computation and what actually happens when someone has to get So I guess uh, I, the only thing I can say is that I'm a, since we're modelers, we have to make choices on. We know that well, most models are wrong. We have to make a choice on what we want to answer and focus on, which has always been. To look at the biochemistry coupled to the food dynamics to look at how these clocks form. So I mean, maybe I it's think it's great what you're doing because I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm playing down the data. Yes, so yes. So if I, you know, if I was a, a, a doctor and I wanted to know that, you know, let me take everything into account and kind of trust you. Uh huh, uh huh. Um, well, I've looked at some, some models of just blood flow looking at interactions with red blood cells and, and platelets, and they're very, you know, they're very complicated models. And um, I suspect, like for example, you see that we have this like non-uniform uh, profile for the mobile platelets to transport them. It's actually caused by red blood cells pushing them to the wall. Mm -hmm. So of course there are things there are things like that where the, having the full non-Newtonian fluid model, you can account for those things without pre-imposing them. So I do think there's an effect of the non-Newtonian fluid. I just don't know how sensitive the differences would be right now. Can you go to your PDU slide? Yes. Which one? This one. one. Yes. <laughs> so there's a lot of stuff on here. Yes. <laughs> all these all these K things. Yes. They're coefficients. Yes. They're rate consoles. They're inputs, basically. This is stuff you control and know how to control. So either it's something we assume or we 
So a lot of these terms are like there's not a good way to measure them. So these are actually probably you can think of these as knobs, knobs maybe. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. So, so so that's exactly my question. Yes. So how sensitive is what you're doing to the settings of these knobs and how how much experience do we have with how you should be setting these knobs? So as of right now, uh, Dr. Wiedermans has a intravascular model of this and she chose parameters for these in her old model, or these two, this one is not in that model. But um, I'm using her values, so that's something. Ultimately, maybe you can do something like me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So K adhesion is actually comes from real estimates of platelets and the rate that they adhere to collagen. Okay. Um, the ADP activation is uh, based on actual concentrations, and it's just a threshold that says yeah. if they can see this particular concentration, they become chemically activated. So those two, I would say, are pretty well known. The cohesion, we don't know what that should be. Um, it's hard to measure because there's multiple ways that the platelets actually cohere with one another. And one of the things that Nick is actually working on is a more biologically relevant model of platelet aggregation that's going to take into account multiple receptors that the needs group is going to knock out each one, and then we'll try to be able to turn those knobs. Uh, can, can you show us that there's another such equation that you studied? Yeah. yeah, this one here. Do you know whether or not this one has a unique solution or? <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> uh, I think they have a unique sol solution yeah. because of this Neumann bundle condition. If you had it zero for you everywhere, then probably you don't have any solution. Yeah, but thankfully there's still Dirichlet conditions on the rest of the walls. Um, I know you and Nick are looking at well, this, this method, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, there's um, another sort of equation. Uh, um, but yes, so, so what you have is another uh, Neumann bonding condition, right? On, yes, on, on, the part, on the inlets and the outlets. And probably this implies uniqueness, I think. So, <laughs> you think um, comparison to experiments are going to be limited? By the boundary conditions, because as I understand it, the experiment takes place on a chip, right? Yes. So, don't you kind of have uh, uh, no slip boundary conditions in the experiment itself? Like, wouldn't you need to go to 3D to, if you want to make more, <laughs> I don't know, reasonable comparisons? Oh, man. To we just because, can't win, can we, guys? <laughs> but since, but since it's, it's like so quasi no, 2D agree. an experiment, so uh, there's, have, there's a little asterisk I have not mentioned here is that since we're doing it in 2D, if you know anything about, it, like, like, let's say you get flow in a pipe, in 2D it's actually flow between two parallel plates versus in 3D it's actually like a rectangular cross section. So actually the resistance laws are different in those two setups. So this is something we're, we're faced with right now and we're going to have a discussion in the future is about how how do we, even even with the non utility fluid, how do you set up same experimental setup versus the computational game if you're doing 2D. So uh, one idea is that we we basically ask our experimentalists to create this split flow split flow device where the aspect ratio going out of the so in the Z direction is much higher than what you see. So then it can emulate more like a parallel plate flow. But this is something we haven't even really explored yet. But we're planning to explore it. A lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually a physicist, but so I'm, I'm coming from like a, a way outside like experimental viewpoint. So forgive me. Uh, it seems like you've drawn your picture to match an experiment that exists. Yes. And so how I perceive how you might use this is that they do an experiment, you run a model, and then you compare the two and try to get match as much as you want, and then you get some parameter estimates out of your model. Yeah, that means something. Yes, but this is a this strikes me as a really specific scenario. Do any of those parameters generalize to something that kind of matters in in, in the sense of you know when you go to three D, when you uh -huh. change the shape of your your slot, the size of it even, you know, is uh -huh. the slot way smaller than your channels? Is it you know on par in size? 
No, uh, no I'm not. I'm not saying is it now. I'm just saying when you change those things, it strikes me as something that could yes. drastically change what happens. Yeah. And, right. and I guess yeah. those are things we're gonna have to explore moving okay. forward. So yeah, yeah. I don't know yet. So. All right. The ultimate goal is to just. I'm sorry. I'm yeah. <laughs> is it just to um, match this particular situation um, with flow and just replace it? I mean, the goal is to learn something about this parameter space in hemophilia, where you know we want to go back and look at the biochemistry and ask what are the what are the sensitive um, parameters that really affect the disorder in Australia. And what Nick didn't tell you is that before we could do PDE computations, we have a sort of complicated ODE model that is being analyzed in a sort of statistical way to try to do an initial narrowing down of that parameter space. And then we're going to try to test all those things in the PDE model, narrow it down further, and then and then test it and validate it in the, in the experiments. That's sort of the goal. So hopefully, you know, we will learn something about about the, the, the disorder, but that seems like it's just a complicated problem so far away. Slow <laughs> <laughs> process. <laughs> it's slow. Well, hopefully, I'm not bug fixing anymore. Yes. Yeah. So. All right. All right. I think well, I've exhausted my time. Let's see. Nick. <laughs>